case study number one. For the remaining nuggets for this series, we're really doing case studies. And for that reason, I don't have a whiteboard. Uh, because the whiteboard would only say one thing on it, case study. <laughs> That'd be kind of boring. So instead, we're just going to go ahead and take a look at a case study that you'll be able to download and look at on your own as well. And it really all starts off in this case with a story, believe it or not, about my mother. A few months ago, my mother came into possession of an electric dryer that did not have a pigtail on the end of it, or on the back of it. And those of you that know appliances know what a pigtail is. It's just about a five-foot electrical cord that uses 220 power, and you screw it onto the back of the dryer, and then you plug the other end into a wall socket that's specially designed for 220 power. It looks something like this. And it's got a kind of a weird socket on the end of it here, and this is where you just screw these contacts onto the dryer itself. Well, I went down to the Home Depot, and I brought back a pigtail like this to her, and I was just about ready to uh, screw it onto the dryer. I had pulled it away from the wall so I could see the socket that this end goes into. And my mother says, well, could you just make sure it fits? She was a little bit insecure about it. Can you just make sure it fits so that we make sure we got the right one? And I said, okay, dear old mother. She's like 86 years old, you know, and uh, was a little bit concerned. So I decided I'd go ahead and plug this end into the wall socket just to make sure it fit. And as soon as I did that, I heard an al alarming, you know, electrical snapping, popping sound. And it was then that I realized I was stupid. <laughs> you see, I didn't turn off the breaker box before I plugged that in, and a couple of these contacts were touching one another, and it caused a short. And I could have ended my CBT Nuggets video career very quickly uh, on that day. And it's on that day that I decided our local electrical company, which I think is Arizona Public Service is the name of the electric company, I think they should have changed their name to something more fitting known as Zap Electricity. And that takes us to our first case study for this series. Now, before proceeding, what you need to do here is to go to www.nuggetlab.com and download this case study. And in fact, there will be more than one case study up there. Or download any of the files associated with the 70-297 series here. And you're going to need to read through this thoroughly before we proceed because it will have much less meaning. And I can, I can kind of spoon feed all of this to you. But if you have a chance to think through it on your own first, it will make a lot more sense to you when we go through it. And the answers that I provide will will be a lot more complete for you when we get to the end here. This is just a case study where we're going to take a look at what you might have in a situation with the corporation, give you a little bit of information about the, the company, give you a little bit of information about the existing directory structure, their network infrastructure. There might be one or more diagrams, depending on the case study that we look at. This one only has this one. We'll have others later on. We have some upcoming changes we're looking at. We're going to take a look at some things that various different people within the company see as potential problems or objectives that they have for the company. And we'll also take a look at some business considerations and organizational requirements. So go ahead and download it. Take your time in reading through it. And when you're done, go ahead and resume this recording. All right, now assuming you've gone ahead and downloaded this and read this through thoroughly, let's go ahead and take a look at some issues related to this. And I hope I'm not going to try to make you dizzy by scrolling up and down too much, uh, but some, po some portions of that would be unavoidable because we have seven pages here. And we're going to be skipping back and forth a, a, a bit here. Now, first thing I want to point out to you is with a case study, when, when you have this information, you might come up with all kinds of other questions, say, well, it says we've got three, you know, three sites here and 800 users, 400 users, 300 users. No, it doesn't say anything about what kind of work they do, what kind of applications they run. Um, you know, how much internet dependence do they have? <laughs> if they're like most companies, it's nearly 100% internet dependence. Anyway, um, what, there's a lot of things that you might wonder about this. There's things about the directory structure. It doesn't say anything here about what they're using for their email servers. Uh, it doesn't say anything in the infrastructure here, what kind of routers they're using. Are they using Cisco, 3Com? Yeah, don't worry about any of that. Okay. When you get to a case study like this, you can only work with what you have. Uh, you might also look at this diagram and say, couldn't they have come up with a better artist? I'm sorry, that's the best I could do at the time, all right? So anyway, there's several things when you look at a case study that you, you'll come away a lot of times with more questions than answers. But our objective with this case study is to really just kind of quiz ourselves and see what we've learned uh, potentially over all the CBT Nuggets videos that you've, that you've uh, listened to and you might have been with me from the beginning or if this is your first video with CBT Nuggets, uh, how much you already knew when you came in because with this particular, uh, with this particular series for the 70-297, a lot of it has to do with design and thinking through things uh, that you already know. You already know the technical way to set up a domain controller. You shouldn't have to be taught how to next, next, finish through that. Uh, but, but you might need to know how many domain controllers you should use and whether or not you're going to have the available redundancy that you need. For example, let's look at this statement. A domain controller in each site must always be available for a local logon to any domain 
within the company. This also means that I might have one domain or I might have more domains. So you need to know how to plan through that kind of thing and think through the company situation here in such a way that we'll be able to come up with appropriate answers down here in the questions section. So now as we look at this first question, let's just go ahead and read it out loud and, uh, and consider the answers. You want to design an Active Directory infrastructure that will meet the needs of your company. You want to consolidate the domains in forests as much as possible. Which domain structure should you use? And the key here is we already know we're going to Active Directory because that was stated earlier. But the key here is you want to consolidate the domains in forests as much as possible. Now this gives us a little bit of an ambiguous timeline because it says I want to consolidate domains and forests. Well, I'm an existing NT4 domain, which doesn't use for us. That's an Active Directory issue. So what we have to assume here, then, is that this is at the end of the entire upgrade process after we're done, and we go home and sleep easy on the night of the final day of the upgrade. And you can drive yourself nuts asking too many questions about this. Just take this at as much of a face value as you can. You might, because some people are a little bit, uh, you know, <laughs> anal retentive about this kind of thing, and they'll say, wait a minute, is that in... In the middle of the upgrade, how many domains have I upgraded from NT4? Because if I'm just upgrading my NT4 domains, and I'm going to keep them that way for a while, and then later on I'll, I'll consolidate them all into another domain, oh, where am I in that timeline? Where am I in that process? Oh, don't worry about that. This is just at the end of the day, okay? So you ask too many questions about this, and it'll drive you insane. All right. Now, let's take a look at some clues up in this case study that will give us uh, some answers to this. First of all, we remember that we already have a separate Phoenix Surprise and Glendale NT4 domains. So there's three domains already right there. And then we also saw down here, uh, let me get down to it, there it is. Uh, there's a team of application developers working on new software that makes changes to the schema. And I want to make sure that anything that they do does, has no effect on company operations in relation to the schema. And assumedly, that's because we don't want them to make a bad typo and screw up the schema and make something really bad and then have the whole company have to live with it. Now, of course, you remember in Active Directory with Windows Server 2003, you can make an active, or rather a schema object defunct, but it's still cleaner if you never make the error in the first place. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to need to do with this then. This means that the, the application developers are going to need one copy of the schema, and the, co the corporation on the whole is going to need a separate version of the schema that's not related to the first copy of the schema that the developers have. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, remember that the schema is a forest-wide item. So you, you have to have separate forests if you want separate schema. So when we get back down to our questions down here, is, uh, anything that says we want only one forest, it, it, we could just discount that out of hand because we know we can't have one forest because we need two schemas, therefore we need two forests. Uh, the next thing we need to take a look at then is which one of these two forest answers is the correct answer. Uh, well, it would be easy to look at the two forests and four domains answer, which would be incorrect, uh, but we'd think of that as, you know, what we've got Phoenix, Surprise, and Glendale. By the way, those are all uh, cities in, in the Arizona area down here, suburbs of Phoenix what those other two cities are. And we could take a look at that and say, well, there's three domains there, plus we need a domain for, uh, for the developers, right? Well, we do need a domain for the developers, and we know that we need at least one domain for the corporation, but that will not translate into four domains. Uh, it could potentially, if I were to just leave my domains in place like we originally had up here, or leave my Phoenix Surprise and Glendale and just upgrade these NT4 domains to Windows Server 2003. But we saw in the objectives of the question that we want to consolidate this as much as possible, and there is nothing in this case study that indicates that we're going to need to retain separate domains. So we can consolidate all of our existing domains into a single domain. And then if we have two forests, each forest is going to need at least one domain. So we're going to have two forests and two domains. One domain for our corporation at large, one domain for our developers with their schema problems. Now with question number two here, what is the most efficient way to upgrade NT4.0 domain controllers? Now what's tricky here is you look at this and it says the most efficient way and the, the first thing that comes to your mind is some kind of an automation or something that makes it much easier for you. So you'll take a look at this and you say, you know, a script would possibly do it. And you can use, we saw earlier in this series where you could use a setup manager to create a script. Uh, however, you cannot use a script to upgrade domain controllers. So that is not a possibility for us. How about SMS or Systems Management Server from Microsoft? Well, uh, that it was not given anywhere in our scenario. So we don't even know that we have an SMS server here anywhere. And it is useful for upgrades. Uh, but we don't have any SMS servers according to our scenario. How, how about a manual method? Well, that's kind of the 
slow way of going and you've got to have someone manning the computer and clicking next, next, finish through everything, uh, certainly you could upgrade an NT4 domain controller or Windows Server 2003. just wouldn't want to, so let's hold on to that one for a minute. Then there's SysPrep. Remember, that's imaging software. Well, by the nature of imaging, as soon as you apply a SysPrep image to a hard drive, it wipes out anything that was already there. So that's not much of an upgrade, you know, unless you're going to do the slash and burn method of upgrading, which really isn't an upgrade at all. Uh, so that's not a good answer. And then remote installation services as well, which you do not use to install domain controllers. In fact, with Riz, you can't even join a computer to the domain when you perform the installation. You would have to do a script later on or, or manually join those computers to the domain later on, much less make them domain controllers. So here's where, again, it was tricky. The most efficient way, again, we're thinking of automation and things like that, and guess what? There is no way to do that when you're upgrading NT4 domain controllers. This is your answer, answer C. You must do a manual upgrade. You're going to have to put the CD in or connect to the source files over the network somewhere and uh, just do an upgrade of that domain uh, using the conventional next, next, finish method. Now let's take a look at number three here as well. What is the minimum number of domain controllers you must install or upgrade? And for this, I'm going to go ahead and use the Microsoft Word split function by going to Window and Split. That allows me to look at two simultaneous portions of the document at one time. So here's question number three, and uh, where I've got my uh, question and answer down here. I'm going to give myself a little more space there. Uh, and then I also want to simultaneously look at question number one up here and compare the two. Because remember, in question number one, we determined that answer C was the correct answer. But what if I had gotten it wrong? This is a good example of where answering one question wrong will almost guarantee that you answer another question wrong as well. For example, what if I had gotten answer A instead and I decided that was the correct answer, which as we know was incorrect? Well, that tells me I'm going to need four domains. And if I apply that incorrect answer to my objectives, and if I go back up here a little further and I look at my organizational requirements, it said that a domain controller in, in each site must always be available. Okay, so that's typically going to mean I need redundancy, and that's going to mean two domain controllers at least for each domain. And I need that in lo for local logons in each site to any domain within the company. So if I think that incorrectly, if I incorrectly think that I need four domains, then what's get that going to do to our scenario here? That's going to mean that I have four domains, and they're going to have domain controllers for each one of those four domains in all of these sites. Now, if I need redundancy, I need two domain controllers for each domain. So 2 times 4 domains is 8 domain controllers in Phoenix, 8 in Glendale, 8 in Surprise, 8 times 3 is 24. That means then that if I had chosen incorrectly for question number 1, that means that I will probably choose question, uh, or answer number D here, answer D, for my answer. And that would be, of course, incorrect. Because we don't need 4 domains times 2 times 3, which is 24. Instead, we need 2 domains. Okay? So we need 2 domains in, in this organization. And if I make a redundant domain controller in each one of these sites, that's 2 times 2, so that's 4 times 3 sites, that will give me a total of 12 domain controllers that I need. Looking at question number 4, we see that we, what DNS namespaces will you use? Choose all that apply. Now again, if you had answered question number 1 wrong, you were probably thinking you need a separate domain for each city, for there's, there's three of your domains, and then you need another domain for your developers, there's you know, developers.local or developers.zapelectricity, either one, and then we also saw that we needed another domain for our, our, cor our corporate web space, www.zapelectricity.com. So you would have probably chosen answer A. So you might have gone with you know, A and let's say D and then E, F, and G. So that's a total of one, two, three, four, five different DNS namespaces that you would have used. Again, that would have been incorrect. How many domains do we have? We have two for the company. Oops, just scrolled up and down here. We have two for the company. Number one, we have uh, corp.zapelectricity.com and we're also going to have developers dot local. Those are our two company domains. And then we have zapelectricity.com as well because remember uh, if you looked at your question further up into this we saw that we want users to pay their electricity bills online using a secure internet connection to www.zapelectricity.com and we also saw further on down here, uh, here it is, that the corporate domain must be distinct from the internet domain name. So in other words, we can't have zapelectricity.com for both our public website and our internal corporation. And we've seen that in a number of different videos I've taught, including this one earlier in this series. So because of that, we know that we need Zap Electricity for the web. And since we need to have a distinct internal uh, domain, we can just make it a child domain, corp 
.zapelectricity.com. That would work, and that would also be the root of that forest for our corporate namespace. And then we can have another uh, forest at developers.local. We could potentially make this one also uh, a forest on its own, but that would potentially be confusing in terms of separating out this DNS namespace and making these two separate forests. So this would be a better choice for that one, developers.local. And then we, of course, would not choose these last three. So to review that, again, here's our public web space, www.zapelectricity.com is what we're going to need. We're going to need that for the top. And then we need this for the forest root, corp.zapelectricity.com. And then finally, to make it a separate forest here for our developers, we need developers.local. There are your three answers, A, B, and D. Now for question number five, I've gone back to a split here. Let's take a look at this question. You need to configure a user desktop environment that will meet company requirements using the fewest steps possible. What should you do? And then select all that apply. Uh, here where we're going to see what our existing desktops are is that all workstations are Windows 98. And if we scroll further on down, we see some uh, key statements by certain important people within our company. First of all, the CFO, uh, he's on a tight budget and he says, uh, Windows 98 has worked fine for years. <laughs> I don't know where that's ever been true. But anyway, it only needs to be rebooted every few days. Uh, I don't know where that's true either. It seemed like I was rebooting you know, a couple of times a day back when I used to run it. And he doesn't want to spend any more money than necessary on computers if it's not necessary. I guess I was a little redundant there. But anyway, you get the idea. Now, the CIO statement is that we must gain better control of the user desktop environment. Sometimes there's wallpaper that's offensive or something that the different people are putting on there. Oh, we want to have better control of the user desktops, and we don't want the IT department to police those desktops. And then the IT manager says that we have secure information on the desktop computers, and we want to make sure that we implement uh, desktop computers using the most stable and secure operating system possible. No, it's not Linux, for those of you smart Alex out there that are saying Linux. <laughs> or maybe it is, but, you know, a lot of my paycheck comes from Microsoft products. So I'm going to say Microsoft all the way, all right? Windows XP in this case. Now this again is another question down here where I go back down to the bottom where we could potentially give the wrong answer depending on what we interpret further up in here. Because if you went only on the basis of the CFO who doesn't want to upgrade the Windows 98 computers, then you're going to assume that we need to keep Windows 98 and we need to control what people use for their wallpaper, which you can do using system policies. Back in NT4 and all that, you could use system policies to control the desktop. Well, in this case, we're moving to an Active Directory environment and we can't keep Windows 98 because it doesn't meet our other objectives. Therefore, we will not be able to use system policies. Uh, what we will be able to use, however, are group policies. We know we're going to need those, so B is definitely going to be an answer. C, what about that? Use imaging software to deploy a consistent sysprep desktop image. Well, you could get everybody started with the same desktop image, uh, but you got you know over a thousand computers in this environment. That's not going to be practical to do that on every computer. Uh, so, but pl plus, they'll just be able to change the wallpaper to whatever they want later on without something like a group policy or something. Uh, so C by C on its own really is not an answer. So the correct real answer here. Well, actually, look also at this one. Remove all users from the power users group except for IT department users. Well, if you would answer E, this is simply reflects uh, a lack of knowledge about what power users is. That doesn't mean that you have to be a power user to change your user's desktop, or it doesn't mean that being a power user gives you more security. In fact, it might give you less security if you have users that don't really know what they're doing on that desktop and they have too much privilege. So certainly E would not be an answer either. So your correct answers here are going to be group policies because we're going to be in an Active Directory environment using a modern Windows client such as Windows XP, so it's going to be B and D as your correct answers. And even though you could start with C, you, see, you have to understand that we want to make sure that we meet these requirements using the fewest steps possible. And to redeploy the entire organization by using a sysprep image is quite a few steps involved in that. So that would not make C a viable answer. Again, we're at B and D. Now down here we see that we need to make sure that the satellite office bandwidth is sufficient for the billing application. And what we need to do here is to go back up to the top to the existing network infrastructure. Note that the satellite offices each use a single reporting computer in each of those offices. And they report customer payment information over a custom app, uh, using a custom application over TCP port 7823 to AppServe 1 in Glendale. These satellite offices do not require internet access, and most of the network traffic is for the billing application. Also looking at the network administrator, we can see why we have this question, because he, he's not sure that the 56K lines to Glendale are sufficient for the application. The application periodically bursts traffic throughout the day, doesn't know how much network traffic 
that actual application requires. So then, how should we answer question number six? Number one, uh, well, first of all, you want to make sure that the satellite office bandwidth is sufficient. What do you do? Uh, well, upgrading the satellite links uh, does not make sure that the existing satellite bandwidth, office, office satellite bandwidth, is sufficient. So upgrading the link doesn't confirm whether or not 56K is enough. Let's take a look at some other answers. You could, it looks like from these answers, you could use either system monitor, because that's what these several answers are, or network monitor. Now, what you might want to do here, first of all, is to rule out whichever one would not apply. Uh, network monitor, you can look at all the traffic from AppServe 1, to or from AppServe 1 here, but you would have to search for traffic on TCP port 7823. And it would just show you the contents of the packet, and you could potentially go through and add up each one of those packets, but that would be a manual process. That would, the network monitor is not generally used to show you the quantity of information that goes across the network. It shows you the specific contents of each packet. So if I wanted to see if there was a specific flag turned on uh, to that AppServe 1, then I could use Network Monitor to look inside the packet and see that information. But otherwise, Network Monitor is not useful for that kind of thing in terms of determining the quantity of network information. Uh, regardless of whether I apply it just to that server or to each reporting computer in each satellite office. So let's just rule out anything that says network monitor on it. So that leaves us, of course, with system monitor. Now let's take a look at some of these answers. Use system monitor to monitor the application server's network interface and then look at the current bandwidth. That doesn't tell us anything. If we just look at the network interface card on that one server and look at the current bandwidth, it would show us a bandwidth of probably 100 megabits per second or 10 megabits per second, whatever the bandwidth capability was of that network interface card. That doesn't really tell us how much traffic is coming from those clients um, itself. So that's not a, really an issue that we can use here. How about this next one? Use System Monitor Monitor App Serve 1's network interface. This is getting a little closer. Bytes total per second. Since that's the majority of the network traffic that comes to and from AppServe 1 is from these satellite office computers that do the reporting, uh, that might be a viable option. However, this would do nothing to distinguish among the various different satellite offices. I mean, I might be getting a total figure here, but it doesn't do anything to tell me whether or not one satellite office has sufficient bandwidth, and maybe another satellite office that has more clients that come into that office to pay their bills. Maybe they have more clients that come in, and they don't have sufficient bandwidth. So this is not specific enough. Let's look at another one. Uh, system monitor to monitor each reporting computer in each satellite office network interface. And again, looking at the current bandwidth. Well, uh, again, we're just looking at the network interface card, which is probably connected to uh, the LAN there, which is a 10 megabit per second or 100 megabit per second, something like that. That's not really going to tell us anything about the bytes to and from the specific uh, satellite office computers. So that leaves us pretty much with answer E. Use system monitor to monitor each reporting computer, so that way we get a distinct figure for each one to see whether or not they're getting sufficient bandwidth. So we got monitoring each com computer in this each satellite office, and we're looking for the total number of bytes per second. And over time, if we get a, a good baseline going, we should be able to determine from that uh, whether or not we have sufficient bandwidth for those 56K WAN links. Well, that takes us partway through the first case study. Let's go ahead and uh, take a break, get yourself a cup of coffee, and then start again on the next video for the remainder of this case study number one. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.